Ash Winter re-recording. Welcome to the H Hour Studio and uh, pre-podcast interview done, icebreaker done for the patrons. Now we're on to the uh, podcast royale. Podcast, I've never said that before. Podcast royale, HR podcast royale. Welcome, mate. Welcome. How are you doing? Thank you. Yeah. Um, first off, I'd like to say sorry I'm late. I was uh, five minutes late in true cavalry fashion. Huzzah! Huzzah! <laughs> oh, you have a question for you, actually, on that. So you were QRH, you were Queen's Royal Hussars, yes. right? What happened to the KRH? Oh, they're still there. Okay. Still What's the about? difference between the two units, then? Uh, we're better. <laughs> 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 um, no, we're... we're, um, we're Essentially, we're the same. We, we do this. Well, we did the same thing, and I'm led to believe that there are now only two main battle tank regiments in the British Army, which is the Royal Tank Regiment and the Queen's Royal Hussars. I'm led to believe that KRH are changing to. I think they're going to the new Ajax. I think I've heard that somewhere. Like, so are you fully clued up on your? You just remember to be on that mic. Put it, put it in closer if you want. Um, are you? Uh, are you fully clued up on all the, the, the changes, the Ajax stuff, the changes coming in with the armour? Because I'm with a clue. No, so not not really. Um, what are they changing? I mean, the Challenger Two is changing to Challenger Three, and I'm led to believe that the um, the armour um, the armament's going to be a a generic um, smooth bore, so we can exchange um, ammunition with the Americans. I, I think. Um, I know the turrets changed. There's a lot more technology gone into it, um, so that again they can share spares with the Germans, the Danes, um, Americans, and everyone else who's got the same sort of technology in their turrets. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I heard um, I heard the other day actually on a from a serving officer that they they're they're downsizing the army again. From eight yard to seventy yard thousand, I didn't know about this, but yeah, down yeah, I, I don't know the official numbers, but yeah, it's uh, it just seems a shame to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, not, not much left. There's not much army left, is there? Uh, when, when you think back to to even even when I was in Germany, you know, what was it now? Probably fifteen, twenty, yeah, twenty years ago. Um, it seemed like a huge army, uh, and then when I speak to my dad, how big it was back in the seventies. Um, you know, it it just seems to be shrinking all the time, doesn't it? Yeah, someone said to me, it's someone said, was it Barclays? Barclays, the, the number of staff in Barclays is more than the number of staff in uh, the in British in the British Army. Wow. Um, yeah, I don't. Oh, maybe even the HM forces. I don't know. I've got no idea. No, it can't be HM forces. But anyway, yeah. Anyway, would you, uh, if you went back to start your military career again, would you be a would you be a tanky again? Well, I was never a tanky. I was cavalry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning, I'm learning. <laughs> right, so cavalry, would you go back to be cavalry again? Oh, 100%. 100%. Um, yeah. You know, obviously at times you, you sat there and... Well, let's start from the beginning where... where uh, my, my dad was two para. Um, I, I went to the recruiting office uh, to join a parachute regiment. And of course, the recruiting sergeant there was Queen's Royal Hussars. And uh, I, you know, loved driving at the time. He sort of said, Oh, can you drive? Yes. Do you like driving? Yeah, love it. Oh, why don't you fancy, fancy this? Um, but yeah, I was hooked. And uh, I, I was that recruiter in the, the last job in my military career. Um, and I'd like to think we'd, we'd sort of evolved a little bit, but there's always. If you're talking about the military to some some y young person that's came into an office, you're going to be more passionate about the regiment you're in anyway, just because you know more about it. Um, so, you know, and, and really, would I have passed P Company? Probably not. I don't think. Never know. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, with all the all the beat up training, maybe. But I, you know, I, I'm I'm very much suited to the cavalry way of life. Um, uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, yeah. So the answer to the question, yeah, 100%, I'd do the same again. What is the... Ca describe me in one sentence, the cavalry way of life. Go on, I'm intrigued. Is it pipe smoking? Pipe smoking and cravats? No, well, there's plenty of cravats about, yeah. But um, we, we are classed as the gentleman soldier, you know. <laughs> I like to think that we're, we're, we're just that bit more... You know, there's a bit more finesse about us. You Fuck know. Off. Um, 
we had a bit of dignity to the to the battlefield, you know. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I, I just I, I love the ethos of it. I've I, I bought into the history of it, and um, yeah, I, I'm I'm very proud of what I've done. Um, What's the worst job in a tank? You got the, in the Challenger Two, right? You got the commander, you got the driver, you got the rad up, and you got the the weapon systems, dude. Yeah, so for me, the, the drive, driving was one of the best bits, but it's the things that go with the driving. So you've got to do the maintenance, and you've got to clean the tracks, and you've got to change the oil and everything like that. And the, the dirty job, if you like. Um, yeah, it's probably the worst job for me personally. We've, we've all got our, our worst job. Um, I think the best job was the operator where you're doing radios, map reading, and loading the weapon system. Um, so there's only three in the tank. Four. So you've got the driver, yeah. the operator, yeah. the gunner, and the commander. But you just said the operator can. The op operator do does the everything. Systems. Yeah, he does everything. Oh, he can do it, right? Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So the, the way it works is when you first join, or, or this is how it used to be anyway. The first thing you would do is driving and maintenance. Um, so you become a driver, um, and then you would become a gunner once you've been promoted, normally, uh, and then you go on to be an operator, and then. You know the pinnacle is commander. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to to command. Um, something I I do regret. Um, and, and if I had my time again, that's that's certainly what I'd aspire to be. Um, but one of the best jobs actually is going along the prairie in in Canada, um, firing off the weapon system. It's you know, it's a buzz like no other. I can't think of anything else that makes me smile as much as that. Um, yeah. Nothing, nothing else. Well, may, maybe hurtling around um, the, a race circuit with uh, Jim Cameron. Um, oh, Mission Motorsport. Mission Motorsport, you've done that. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I've done a few things with Jim, yeah. Um, well, because he's a tanky, whereas I'm cavalry, you see. So a tanky is Royal <laughs> Tank Regiment. Um, so they, they became a regiment because of tanks. They started with tanks, whereas we started with horses and evolved into tanks. Right now, I I got it now. I yeah. got it. So so you're not a tanky. I got a okay, cavalry. I do apologise. <laughs> That's uh, why we call them the council cav. The what? The council cav. Council cav. Because <laughs> yeah. what, what's always got me is that they um <laughs> they, they have bagpipes as well. You see, uh, where uh, I, I suppose it, th there must be a reason for it. But we we came from well, my my regiment's half Irish, so we have Irish pipers. Um. I don't know where the, the RTR have their band from. What do you mean it's half Irish? So they, we, we evolved from the, the Queen's Own and the Queen's Royal Irish. They amalgamated. Um, so it was a, a, an Irish regiment and an English regiment evolved together. Um, so we're now the Queen's Royal Irish, and in brackets, Queen's Own and Royal Irish. Did you have to learn to ride horses? Not officially, no. Uh, you can. You can if you want. Um, and I don't know the situation there, but back in... When I was in Germany, we had a Paderborn Equestrian Centre, um, and there, there was always a contingent of, of people from the regiment who were were there mucking out and riding, and you know, because we I, I don't know how many, but we had a drum horse, there was a charger, um, and I don't know if the others were were personal horses or or belonged to anybody, but there was certainly a drum horse that was on parade with us. Uh, and when we dined out, one of the the command officers he he uh, charged round. Athlone Barracks on his horse, which was absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tell me, your eye condition, how on earth do you say that word? Well, I think of keratoconus. That's what I thought when I first read it. Yeah, go on. It's okay. So it's keratoconus. Keratoconus. Yes. Describe it. Um, it's it's the, the cornea is a, a different shape. Um, so if you were to look at most people's eyes, it would be the you know, the shape of a football. Whereas mine's like a rugby ball. Um, and if you think of a rugby ball, you've got the pointy end and it sort of sticks out in my eye. Um, and and the, the end of the cornea that's normally quite smooth. I don't know why I'm doing hand actions here. To oh, people conference. can see you. Yeah. Yeah. People who are watching this on YouTube. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Give them a little wave. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the, the cornea thins um, and bits come off. Um, and, and this causes a lot of complications for me personally. So I'm looking at you now, and there's probably three of you. Um, and that's because of all the different lights in this in this room. Um, some days I'll get up and, and I just can't function as a human being, which which is really annoying. 
Um, but the, you know, there are ways of, of doing it. So I wear two contact lenses in each eye. Um, if you think of the way an eye is shaped like, like a rugby ball, if you get a, a, a soft contact lens and put that over the top, you know, it's not going to fit because the sticky out bit's going to, you know, push out the, the contact lens and it's not going to be a smooth fit around the edge. So they've designed these contact lenses that are completely rigid, that are like a, a suction cup that go onto my eye. But because it causes a lot of pain, um, they put the soft lens on first and then I put this other lens on top. <laughs> and, and it always feels like there's a piece of grit in my eye. Um, you know, and, and it's just, you know when you've got toothache and you, can, you can't think of anything else? It's just like that constantly with my eyes. What happens if you don't wear the lenses? Um, well, I'm looking at the table now, and there's a, a cup of water there. Um, if I didn't have my lenses, I couldn't see that. It would just be a complete blur of different colours and shapes and, you know, nothingness, really. Um, if I squint, I could maybe make out a shape of, of sorts. But if I was to go and to try and hold that cup... Well, you know, it, it sometimes it will work, sometimes you know, it's hit or miss. So you can imagine trying to make a coffee on the morning before I've got my lenses in, which is why, you know, I never do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, and, and there's so many different <laughs> different challenges that, that even come with wearing lenses at different times of year, different temperatures, humidity, lighting. Um, and... and that there's other complications that go with it. So I've got something called posterior blepharitis, which is um, blockage of the tear ducts, basically. And it's quite a common problem. But for a contact lens wearer, though, you know, when you close your eye, that's supposed to then lubricate the contact lens to keep it moist and, you know, lubricated so you can see. Um, but mine don't, don't work as they should. So the lenses get very dry. And <laughs> there's been occasions... Um, when you know I've been driving along, because I'll you know I'll say now I'm not blind by any stretch of imagination, not whatsoever. There are days when I'd see myself as blind, but you know 99% of the time I'm not. So I can still drive. I've, I've just about passed the the driving threshold um, in a controlled environment. So I'm driving down the motorway at 70 miles an hour, and bing, contact lens flies out. You know you've then got to have that decision to to get to the hard shoulder to stop and then try and find the bloody lens because, you know, they're tiny. Um, my wife says I, I can see my lenses on the floor better than she can <laughs> because I don't know what it is. It must be instinct because, you know, they cost a couple of thousand pounds each, these lenses, and, and thank God for the NHS because they're subsidised. I only have to pay a fraction of the price um, twice a year. And uh, I find these lenses every time they fall out anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, wh whether it's a... Normally, I've got the other lens in the other eye. So, you know, it's not as if I'm completely looking for something that's not there. You know, th there is a, a bit of vision. Um, and normally, if there's a bit of light shining through, it reflects so you can see it. Otherwise, I'm on the hands and knees, you know, looking like this with my hands patting everywhere to try and find them. Um, and, and, yeah, <laughs> there's been a few occasions when, they, when I've been driving and they just ping out and land. It, normally, I've got shades on. Um, no matter what the weather. So normally they'll just ping out and f for some reason, thankfully, they'll stick to the inside of my shades. <laughs> um, but on the occasions when I'm not or if I'm a passenger or something, and they'll, they'll just fly onto the dashboard and, and half the time they'll just stick to something. So, <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it, there could be a TV series made out of it. It's hilarious at times. <laughs> <laughs> Were you still serving when you realised your eyesight was going pear-shaped and you started noticing? Um, I, w I was serving on a full-time reserve service contract. Um, which is a, a non-operational home commitment. Um, so essentially, it's supposedly a, a nine-to-five Monday-to-Friday job in uniform, um, which was was perfect for me at the time. Um, and and I, I was wearing glasses, thinking that you know you get to middle age and you think, well, maybe I'm getting old. Maybe this is just the way I am. You know, you just see so many people wearing glasses. It, it's just my turn. Um, but I went to the the opticians. And they, they sort of said, well, yeah, you need glasses, blah, blah, blah. You've got an astigmatism, um, which, again, is very common. Um, so I thought nothing of it. Bought some glasses, spent, I think, £250 on a nice pair. So I thought, you know, 
I'm going to wear them every day. I need to get a nice pair. Within six months, I'd had another pair. Um, another few months after that, another pair because the prescription had changed. Because <coughs> what it was getting worse. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's been getting worse every day since I think, 2000, end of 2010. I was diagnosed, um, and it, it's got worse ever since. Um, and th- there's no cure. Th- there are things that that can be done to to halt the um, you know the the degeneration of it, but because most people are diagnosed in their late teens, early twenties, I was. Oh, what was I? 28, 29. Uh, it was quite advanced. Um, and, you know, with technology, you never know what's around the corner. But at, at this moment in time, there's nothing specific to say, well, you can have this procedure done that will completely correct it. Um, I can have and, and probably will have um, a corneal transplant, which is basically they cut the front of the eye off and, and put a donor's eye on the front, a, a new cornea on. Um, but I think that the last... Last thing I I saw, it was a fifty percent success rate, um, and w- with my other conditions that go with it, like the the posterior blepharitis. Well, it you know it this cornea would act like a, a contact lens really, so you'd have to have it lubricated. You'd have to um, not have allergies, and uh, you know I've I've got plenty of allergies, hay fever, eczema, and everything like that, which which doesn't help um, with the, with the situation to be honest. So. At the moment, while I'm still driving, while I'm still over that driving threshold, I don't see, and my optometrist thinks the same, you know, it, it, it's not worth the risk of, of having the, the transplant just yet. But we'll see once, you know, once I do go below the, the driving threshold, I've got nothing to lose, really. Um, what was it like when, I, I kind of might, well, I can't, I can't, I can't I can imagine b- being being told... That you that I'd have uh, some some uh, lifelong ailment for whatever better word to deal with. It's going to get going to progressively get worse. How did you how did you deal with that? I went when like where were you when you got when they told you? Uh, I was in a uh, um, I think it was the third trip back to the optician, um, and it was just a, a local optician. I was uh, you know a, and the guy there said I think you've got keratoconus. But he couldn't say it probably either. So <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a bit of a, like, oh, okay. Um, well, what's that? And he, he gave me a leaflet, like, you know, like everything else. And you you read through it and you think, oh, okay. Um, but he only said, you may have it. So what he wanted to try was, was normal contact lenses because the the glasses, were, you can't make glasses um, round enough for, for the sort of curvature of my eye So and anybody else with a condition. That's why they go to contact lenses, because you can have a, a more curved lens. He put these lenses in my eye, uh, and I thought I had a laser beam being shone into my eye, just just normal lighting like it is now. Um, it, it was just so painful. Um, I, I just couldn't tolerate it. And, and it, it took me a good six months to come to terms with the condition I'd got by by joining all these Facebook self-help groups and speaking to a specialist and um, speaking to various different contact lens specialists, optometrists and things. Um, and, and then, I, you know, I, I didn't think too much of it, I don't think, because it was, oh, well, you can get a contact lens or you can wear glasses or, you know, I, I don't think I came to terms with it then about, well, there's, there's no, no fix for it. Um, and and I think it took me two, two and a half years to, to be able to tolerate contact lenses. Um, and I think I tolerate them quite well now, to be honest. It's, it has been 10 years or so. Um, but the, I think that the coping strategy for me was, you know, I'd had my career. I'd done everything I'd wanted to do. I'd, I'd been in the army. Um, I'd been to Kosovo, I've been to Iraq, I'd, I'd done anything anyone would want to do, so I, I thought, well, I'll just go and see what I can do to to help people and to, to see what I can do to, you know, raise awareness for the condition. Um, and uh, so on these self-help groups, I, w- I was doing various things like going out on, on my bike, because there's, there's so many people that won't do anything with, with this condition. And uh, I thought, well... I'm not stopping doing things. 
So I, I've I've been out on my bike. Um, I like doing triathlon, so I I, I go swimming and, and stuff like that. Um, and, and there's a lot of people on these self-help groups saying, "Oh, my 14-year-old son's been diagnosed. You know, he's never going to be able to join the army. He's never going to be able to drive. He's never going to be able to to do anything he wants to do." And and then something clicked in me, and and uh, someone said, "Well, why don't you just write blogs and you know try and document your story?" Um, so, so that's what I did, and you know, I think it started to help people online. And I've, well, I know it has because I've had a few few comments come back saying, you know, it, it's been inspiration what you've been doing, and you know, you've helped so and so be able to fulfil his dreams. He's seen you do this, so he can do what he wants to do, and, and so on. Yeah. What was the first big event you did? I think it was the twenty-four hour mountain bike endurance race. Um, in Gloucestershire, um, it, it, I think they they used to call it the the London Marathon of mountain bike races. So people would turn up and take it really serious, and then other people would turn up in a Superman costume on a unicycle, <laughs> and, and it was a, a it's basically a seven mile off road mountain bike track with a bit of downhill, a bit of technical, and quite a bit of uphill, and uh, essentially you do twenty four hours solid. Um, and see how far you get. So we decided to do it as a... I was doing the army recruiting at the time, so we decided as a recruiting event we would get a team together of army recruiters and go and do it and, um, you know, wear army kit. And uh, it's it's quite demoralising, actually, when you're going up a hill on your mountain bike with army be the best on your back and Superman on his unicycle (laughs) goes past you. (laughs) (laughs) How on earth does a unicycle do off road? No, well, he, he was carrying it most of the way, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> How did you go on? When did you, where did you finish? Uh, we, we finished as a team. We came fourth, um, yeah. which we were absolutely devastated about because if we'd have just put in that little bit more effort, we could have got a, the podium finish, um, which would have been great to take back to the recruiting group and, and say, look, we got this trophy. We you know put the army on the mountain bike map, if you like, and... Um, you know, if, if we'd have come fifth, quite a way behind, you'd be quite happy with that. But to come fourth, and I think we're only one, one or one and a half laps behind the third place, then it's it's a little bit, you know, annoying. Mm-hmm. Um, but we went back the year after, and did it solo. So in the team, you do a lap, pass the baton on to the next person. So you you do. I think the lap took about an hour. So you do an hour, have three hours off. Um, but we did it solo the year after. Which is, you know, it is what it is. You, you go around as many times as you like in those 24 hours. You can stop at your tent whenever you like. Um, and I think I came 10th, which I was, I was chuffed to bits with that, to be honest. Um, and no, there wasn't 11 of us. There was, <laughs> I think it's about 45 uh, in the in the category that I was in. Um, and I went back again for a third time. And uh, I think I came 48th or something. Um, but my head wasn't in it at that time. Um, they changed the route as well, and it, it wasn't it wasn't as easy as it used to be. They they put a lot more technical downhill in it, mm. um, and with my eyesight, going downhill fast on a mountain bike, um, you know, in the twilight hours, is not really the thing to be doing. Uh, so I, I think I must have come off more than I was on the bike, to be honest with you. Um, but yeah, great fun. <laughs> what's been the most what's the most challenging thing you've done what's the most challenging event you've done um, I went to the Arctic with the, the Endeavour Fund they had a an expedition going on um, where there was a team of I think it was eight eight of us going out um, to north Sweden uh, by dog sled and we're out in, uh, you know you're flying to, uh, this is what gets me with this country you know you get a, half an inch of snow and the whole country stops over there we landed a I think it's a 737 on snow, you know, <laughs> um, all piled out of this, this plane. Um, and it was, it was minus 35 and, uh, yeah, we went out, went out into the middle of nowhere, made camp, um, drilled in the, the lake for water. And it was just the most phenomenal experience I've ever had. Bloody freezing, but phenomenal experience. I mean, you, there was a well at this one point and you'd put your bucket down to get your, your fresh water. By the time you brought it up to the surface, it was like a slush puppy. It was, it was 
ridiculous. The one the guys filled his flask at night, ready for the morning brew. And it was, you know, thermos flask. And uh, it was cold by the next morning. It was incredible, absolutely incredible. But, the, you know, we'd, we'd go and have various different local traditional meals at, at little um, reindeer ranches and things, and, and just phenomenal experience. Um, but as we're talking about my eyes, well, the contact lenses, they froze, and they were that brittle, they, they just turned to dust. Um, my eyelids closed together because I have to use this lubricant because, you know, the blepharitis, I can't, I can't lubricate my eyes on it, my lenses, so you, you put solution in, and that was frozen. Um, <laughs> so it was a very, very surreal thing to do. But I documented it all and, and um, sent it to various different specialists around the, around the world. Um, and actually, the, the National Keratoconus Foundation in, in America entered it to their um, film festival. So it was a, a three-minute self-recorded video in, in the Arctic, all these clips of me using my eyes, um, the lenses, and, and various different things. And I won. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely incredible. Um, you know, not not the fact that I'd, I'd won a film festival. You know, that, that wasn't the point. The point was it got this video out there to show so many other people, well, if he's there in minus 35 and he can function with this condition, well, so-and-so down the road can take his kids to school or get out on his bike or, or do something for them. Um, and I just thought that was a, that's what I wanted to get out of it. A apart from the experience for me, because it was just brilliant. Mm. What was the aim of the expedition? How far were you going? Um, from where were you going? From and to? Um, it, there was just a point on a map, um, and and it was the old. I think it was, they called it the old cigarette line or something, um, and I probably should know this, but I, I don't. Um, there was a guide out there. Um, if you've ever seen Ben Fogel on New Lives of the Wild, he did a New Lives in the Snow years ago. Um, and there's a lady over there called Gaynor, British, British lady, uh, that married a local. And it's her her business out there is to to get tourists in and take them out on expeditions. Um, and, and it was her that we used. And and she had this pre-populated route, and um, and we followed it. You know, it it, it was. Um, I think it, for everybody, they had different reasons to be there. Like like any of these these expeditions that we do, you know. And for me, it was to to test myself and to test my eyesight. Um, and some of the other guys were were former Marines, so they wanted to go back to the cold because that's the place they love, and they wanted to test themselves after however many years out from from being, you know, away from, from the military. Um, I, and I think everybody seemed to, to get what they wanted out of it. How many days were you? How many days was it? I think we were there for 10 days. Okay. Yeah. How far were you covering each day, you know? I, I wouldn't like to guess, really. I, I think, all in all, it was about 250 k's. A fair distance. Yeah. It? Yeah. Um, but, it, I mean, these dogs that, that were pulling you, I mean, it was they're phenomenal. You know, the, the distance they covered each day, and, and like I said, I, I really can't remember how, how far it was. Um, but th they were just, they just kept going. And you think of big huskies, don't you, when you think of the Arctic and, and being in the in the snow, but they're not, they're... They just look like your your normal mongrel that's around the corner, and um, I think the biggest issue we had is when when they uh, they go to the toilet on the move, they don't bother stopping. So oh really? Yeah, they'll they'll do that and then flick it up at you. So <laughs> 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 yeah, that that was the one of the biggest dangers that we had. Um, and you know when we we moan about the cold, you know we get there, we set up a tent or we go into a cabin and there's a fire on and you you know you. You're nice and cosy. The dogs sleep outside on a on a bed of straw, you know, open to the elements, and they're just phenomenal. They really are. I mean, you you, you put these like slippers on them if you like um, to to protect their paws, but they come off within thirty seconds. So then you you don't put them on. Uh, a lot of them chew them off anyway. Just at night or throughout? no throughout the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we're a nation of dog lovers, right? And and all of us on the expedition were. And we were mortified that these dogs were staying outside. But they didn't want to be inside. 
you know, we we were speaking to the locals, saying, well, you know, should we should we put a quilt on them or should we go and cuddle them or whatever? No, nope, they won't be happy. And and they, you know, they you can see them when they're running. They're biting the snow to get some some fluids in them. And uh, at, at night, th there's a, a great photo of me cutting up the meat for their dinner, and it's a slab of meat, probably half the size of the table in front of us here. And you know, it, it's frozen for the water content. They eat it so they get the water, and you, you're chopping it with a, a huge axe. You know, and, and <laughs> it, you know, probably better food than than we're eating ourselves. To be honest, we were on on rations. What meat was it? Do you know? I don't know. Don't know. No. What are the locals? What are the locals like? Were they like a bit bit weird? In those kind of places, a bit odd, aren't they're they? In their own way, yes, but so welcoming. You know, the, uh, there's this one reindeer herder that we, we went to, and we all slept in his loft. Um, <laughs> we came down at whatever time it was, um, and he had, he, he'd cooked some dinner for us. It was reindeer stew. So he'd obviously gone out and got one of his reindeer and thought, well, you know, they're my guests, I'm going to feed them. It was this reindeer, reindeer broth, it was. It was different. Tasty? Yeah. Like, well, <laughs> I, I wasn't too keen, to be honest. Um, and it was probably because we were sat at a reindeer ranch, you know, in this farm where, where all the reindeer were running around. And, you know, you think of Christmas and you think of Santa Claus and all this, and you're, you're looking around and oh, I'm eating this. It didn't, didn't feel as, as it should. But then on, on the last night before flying home, we were in a, a very exclusive hotel restaurant and they were serving up reindeer cooked as we would expect it to be cooked uh, and it was absolutely divine so maybe that was just the I don't know the, <laughs> the British in me that was thinking oh, no I shouldn't be doing shouldn't be eating it at the ranch yeah it's, it's strange isn't it so you, you think well it's they, they're like that about necessity right which is what we used to be like we're so, we're so accustomed to being well was civilized, yeah. You know, we we're so used to not seeing the animal that you're eating, yeah. That you that's on your table, that it becomes unusual when you do. I've got a good friend, good friend Mike, um, and uh, another good friend, guy guy called Jeremy Gibbs, and Jeremy Gibbs is, Gibbs is a farmer. He's been on the podcast, and he uh, he's he Mike has got some meat from Jeremy, um, some lamb, <laughs> uh, but, but Jeremy had been sending Mike videos of <laughs> the lamb the alive lamb yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. Look, this is what you're getting <laughs> and i was talking to mike about it it's, just, it's, it's the same thing it's just a bit strange it's like i'm getting he's sending me videos of the lamb that is soon going to be across my table yeah. slaughtered which is bit, yeah but and did it, it have a name though as well that, that it did have a name oh, yeah no. it did have a name horace <laughs> <laughs> I've got Hor so Horace is in the freezer in there. Horace, in there. Mike gave me some of Horace. So I'm gonna oh, have some of Horace. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're just not used to it. No, we're it's not. We we're just not. It's, it's the reality, you know. You, the, we, the meat we have on the tables was alive at one point. Yeah. And um, it almost, you know what? It almost makes it for me anyway. I, I, uh, there you go. Example of Horace, right? Jeremy Gibbs is an, is an, an you know, a guy with ethics and morals. He's he believes in, you know, uh, animal welfare, mm. looking after the animals. Albeit it's a farmer, right? But they should be treated properly for a multitude of different reasons. And I'd rather know where the animal came from, and know they've been treated that way properly. Yeah. Than not, you know, the, than than your than your your, your packet of flipping lamb in the supermarket. You don't know where it's come from. You don't know how it's been. You know, it's that, it's the same thing with the old. Uh, the eggs, isn't it? Free range egg. I started. I started um, shopping free range eggs every time last year. Cause my missus had a go at me. She, she noticed <laughs> I bought. I just bought eggs, but they weren't free range. Yeah. And then I thought, yeah, absolutely right, because I know that yeah, they, they've been treated humanely here. Yeah. It's not like bat some battery farm, which is just hor horrifying, you know. Although on on the flip side to that, when I was in Basra in Iraq, we had uh, we were treated to a, a kebab. Now I know I have no idea what this kebab was, <laughs> but it was the the best kebab. I've ever had in my entire life, and I've no idea what it was. I don't want to know what it was. Yeah, I, I ordered. Chi I think Uganda and ordered chicken. That's by the way, that's proper. That's like salmonella roulette. Po oh yeah, food poisoning roulette. You're playing there, getting a kebab in Basra. No, well, I couldn't turn it down. I was, I was command officer's driver, and uh, we'd gone for this um, quite important meeting, and uh, we had to accept anything that was given to us. 
Ah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Cultural, cultural things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I went to Uganda, and uh, we were told, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't order food from anywhere. But th- this, this, pl- you know, we were um, at the time at this bar. It's called a Drift Bar, run by expats, South Africans, and Australians. Uh, in a town called Ginger, J I N J A, in uh, Uganda. Long story short, we en- we ended up getting drunk at this bar. They'd stopped doing food, so we ordered food in, and the local went off down to the, down to the Ginger town centre and got some. <laughs> we ordered chicken and chips. My chicken turned up. It had four legs and a, and a rib cage. It was it was basically cat. Pretty pretty confident it was cat. But again, tasty, yeah. tasty. If you a little bit of ignorance there. Yeah. It, was, it was very tasty. Very tasty indeed. <laughs> How do you get on to this? Oh, reindeer. Yeah, reindeer. <laughs> yeah. So the locals. Yeah, peculiar. That's, uh, that's that way of ex- 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 existing, though, isn't it? Peculiar but friendly. Yes. Just, you know, it's like... Uh, I bet if you were there for like six months, they wouldn't be friendly to you all the time. No, I think if you, if you bought the ranch next to them and you were competing with them as a farmer, for instance, you know, when you put a wind farm there or something, that no... You know, because you're just a, a visitor, I think they they'll look after you. But anything more than that, no. No, you'd have to leave. I think the local people. And were they just cutting about on the sleds as well? Is that what they got about? No, they had big four by fours and okay. um, snowmobiles and stuff. Yeah, they're they're quite happy cutting about in in anything really. I think they had a Land Cruiser that that fella. Mm. Yeah. Would you do it again? An expedition like that? I would. I, I'm. <laughs> I, I want to go somewhere warm. But the the reason is, I've tested my eyes and the the equipment in in the cold. You know, why, why not go to the the heat and do it in the desert or or in the mountains or something? Um, and I was supposed to go to Mount Tubkal. Um, Don't tell me. Don't tell me where that is. I know where this is. Tubkal, Tubkal, Tubkal. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I know where this is. Why do I know where this is? Why have I been saying that mountain? Oh, monkey mountaineering. Monkey, monkey mountaineering do uh, do um, expeditions there. So is that you? Oh, sorry, go on. I brought a bust in the story. Monkey mountaineering. Guy called Sam Marshall, ex-military. He runs expeditions, and Tubkal is one of the places they go to. Well, I've never heard it. I'm gonna look in, look into that then because yeah. I, I would still love to do it. But this was with a, another um, expedition company. I was just gonna go. Um, I probably should have said, really, I'm a, an ambassador for a charity called Fight for Sight, which is the eye research charity. They they took me on board a few years ago um, because of the things I've been doing. And uh, they invite me to their focus groups and things, and I do a bit of fundraising and that sort of stuff. So I wanted to do something, uh, and a bit of a statement sort of expedition to say, I'm doing this for Fight for Sight to raise some money and, and some awareness. Um, and anyway... Covid hit and uh, it got cancelled. So I saw this other expedition with walking with the wounded. They were doing a, a desert expedition in the Oman at the empty quarter, 450 kilometer walk. Um, so I applied for that, got accepted, um, and I was so excited, as as were all of <laughs> all of the team. Um, and it's I think it's been delayed two or three times now. Um, and then a few weeks earlier, they took the decision to, to cancel it. Oh, no. uh, well, cancel the, the Oman part of it, but they've changed it. It's now reimagined in Britain. So the team are walking from um, the Penny Fan all the way to London, which is about 450 kilometres in 11 days. Um, I was training for this, and unfortunately, I went over on my ankle. I tore my perineal tendon. I had it reconstructed. I've got nerve damage, and um, I can't walk more than 100 meters at the minute without stopping for, you know, pain relief if you like, you know, resting it. But thankfully, I'm on the support team, um, so I'm, I'm going there as part of their welfare team. And um, I had a meeting about uh, media, communications, photographs, and that sort of thing. So I'm part of the media team. Oh, cool. And I've got a keen interest in photography and, and media. Um, so for me, it's, it's win-win, really. I'm going to go there and enjoy this this expedition without walking it um, in the damp and the cold, not the desert. <laughs> um, and I, I'm going to learn as much as I can from the, the media team um, to, you know, to back up my own knowledge, which is, is very little. It's just more of an enjoyment. So 
really looking forward to that. Um, and that starts in a couple of weeks' time as well. That sounds good, mate. Yeah. Um, what, how, how, how are they doing? Is it all... What's the route, then? Um, so... It, they're going to do the penny fan first day, and then they're going to move to to a point. So they're going to sc- they're actually going to scale the, scale yes, the fan. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's a few people in the local area that are they've got businesses that are um, supporting the team uh, that are going to go and walk that route with them, which is you know it's a it's a famous route that's that's been done with the local regiment there anyway, um, which is quite a, a really good way to start, I think. Um, and then they're going to go into uh, to Gloucestershire and start. Uh, and follow the the Thames River all the way down, uh, and finish at the Grenadier Pub in London. Oh right, okay. Following the river, that'd be good. So the reason they're stopping at the the Grenadier Pub is the um, the title sponsor is Grenadier. The have you seen the new vehicle they've got, the Ineos Grenadier? Um, it's uh, their take on the old Land Rover Defender. Absolutely beautiful little beast. Um, and that that's where they came up with the idea for this this vehicle. So that's. That's where we're going to end it. Quite a poignant place. Where in London is the Grenadier? London. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got no idea, to be honest with you. Um, no. Wouldn't even like to guess. What day are you finishing there? Um, you know? I think it's the... Oh, you put me on the spot now, haven't you? So it starts when? So it starts on the 9th, 9th yeah, of October. So finish on the 20th. Um, and it's the... Yes, yeah, two weeks. Oh, 14 days. Okay, yeah. right. Okay, 23rd. Hmm. Okay. I'm just trying to work out if I'm going to be in London at that time or not. Well, I'll send you the details. It's probably yeah. the best way to do it. But yeah, it'd be nice. That's the next big one. How many people on the team? The team was um, six strong, um, but there's been quite a few little injuries and niggles. Um, so there, there, there are six of them, but they're, they're all going to walk um, at, at various points, I think. Um, depending on their injuries and oh ailments. Right, okay. um, I think the core team will do, th- there's a, probably three or four of them that will do the, the whole hog. I'm quite confident of that. And where, are you, where are you stopping each night then? <laughs> Various different places. Um, farm buildings, um, local village halls, you know, anywhere they, they can they can get to really. They're, they're pulling a, a trolley with them as well with the, that was supposed to be with us in Oman. Um you know, to carry the kit and the water. Obviously, water won't be a problem in this country, will it? But, you know, just to, to go on with the same ethos as, as they were doing out in, in Oman, we're going to try and carry on with that same thing over here as best we can. You can't do that in London, of course, but, you know, as far as we can, we will. Mm. Mm. That's good, mate. Sounds good. Sounds good. What are you going to hit after that? Um, Two cars. Oh, it's Morocco, right? Two cars in Morocco. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, Morocco, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I I don't know what I'm going to do because with this injury I've got at the minute, I, I physically can't do anything. I, I went for a swim last week um, and I think I did 17 lengths and, and it was just too painful. Um, I went for a bike ride yesterday. I did two and a half miles. It was too painful. Um, That's a nightmare. I, I, it's just, you know, I'm doing everything I'm told. I'm doing everything for the physio. I, they've said to swim, they've said to cycle. I, I just can't do it. So, because of the pain, yeah. yeah. So I'm back at physio again this week. So we'll, we'll see what comes of it. Maybe we'll we'll change up the the routine and the exercises. Um, as long as I don't have to have another cast on, because that was a bit of a nausea, especially being my right leg. Um, obviously, driving leg in it. So we'll see what happens. But uh, I've got an ambition still for Invictus Games. Oh really? Um, I trialed for the. 2017 Toronto Games didn't make it. What um, sport? I did swimming, rowing, and cycling. Okay. And uh, it was brilliant. Do you know the the whole sort of build up to it, the the trial weekend, um, just seeing so many familiar faces. Uh, from my point of view, I, I worked when I started full time reserve service. I I worked at the Queen Elizabeth and Selly Oak Hospital as part of the welfare team up there. So I saw a lot of these guys coming back injured from Iraq, Afghanistan, wherever it may be. And then to see them and be part of their journey again and actually be be in their sort of in their bubble if you like. We use that term now a lot, probably too much, but in their bubble of being an athlete. Um I know looking at me I don't look like an athlete whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> um it it was just phenomenal. And uh 
to to sort of test myself and test my eyesight on some of these sports was was brilliant. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've never been really fit enough to to compete at anything like that, um, but I really enjoy it, and I think for me that's that's the most important thing. And if I can get onto a, an Invictus team um, and and go and be part of the games, I, I just think that'd be incredible. How does it work then? How do the trials work? How do, how does all that fit together? Talk to me about that. How do you even end up applying? Um, so I'm I'm part of um, Hell for Heroes Band of Brothers. Um, so I'm classed as wounded, injured, sick service person. Um, so I get various amounts of different. Well, pre-COVID, I think there was probably five, or six emails a day that we were getting to invite us to to different bits and bobs, and one of them was the Invictus Games. Um, inviting us to to apply to to be a, a participant. Um, and yeah, I thought, well, that looks great fun, you know. Let's let's have some of that. And um, it turned out that you know you go for the initial briefing, um, training camp for for a specific sport. So for me, it was I think the first one I did was swimming, um, and we went down to HMS Devonport in their their pool there, um, and, and we were, I mean, it was the British coach that was there, the British swimming coach, and. Um, I mean, they were, they were putting us through our paces, all right. You mean the British, like Olympic swimming, mm. the British swimming team yeah. coach? Pro- yeah. Ah. Um, and and they're still doing that now. I I had um I, I tried out at wheelchair tennis a few weeks ago, with uh, the Invictus Games were putting on a well the Invictus Games Foundation were putting on a, a try it try it day, uh, and again there was a a registered British you know works down in uh, the National Tennis Centre. Um, and he was there teaching us wheelchair tennis. Incredible, really. You know, it's a hell of a following for the Invictus Games uh, and the Foundation. And, um, yes, yeah, so I went to try all these different sports out. And they, they sort of, you know, that then they don't pick the best athlete. They'll pick the, the person they think will get the most out of it. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. The, I mean, there is an element of some of them that are elite athletes that then go on to the Paralympics, you know. Um, so you look at Jacko Van Gas this year. You know he's a, a Paralympic champion now. You know so you've got people like that 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 you know will will get to the Invictus Games because that's their sort of recovery pathway to get through. Um, and I don't know what percentage it is, but the, the you know the, when I was there at the the um, Bath Uni when Prince Harry was giving his speech was everybody will be taken into consideration for what they will get out of it. Um, and I just think that's brilliant, you know. And, and unfortunately for me, I didn't make it to the the actual games, but I'm st- I still feel part of it. I still I'm still included with the the Invictus Games Foundation. Even now, they're doing um, various different at home sports, um, and you know a lot of other things apart from sports. They have guest speakers in and things for motivation, inspiration, that sort of stuff. And I just think it's a really good following, a really good community. Yes. Yeah, so what are they, have they changed? Are they changing slightly what what they do? Are they, have they changed slightly what they what they do now from when they started up? I'm a bit and they are ignorant on the subject. Well, they. Um, I mean, uh, this isn't. You know, I, I don't work for them. I don't know. Um, but they they merged with the Endeavour Fund, um, so they have what they call Invictus Endeavours, which is what this tennis tryout day was. It's it's not a trials for the games. It's not, you know, it's not part of the Invictus Games. It is just a an endeavour for you to go and get involved in and, and help with your recovery pathway. Um, so I think they are diversifying away from just being about the games because, you know, it must cost a fortune to put the games on. Um, I think the next one's been delayed as well because of COVID, that's next year now. Um, but there's plans for another one the year after in, I think it's Dusseldorf. Oh. Um, and then, who knows from there, you know. I'm hoping for a, a winter Invictus, that'd be perfect. Uh, I um, have you heard of Battleback? Yeah, yeah, I've heard about Battleback. So yeah. um, the part of being a wounded engine sick service person, I got invited to to a Battleback skiing um, course. I'd never skied before, ever. You know, one thing in the military, you think everybody who lives in Germany goes down to Winterberg and skis, but I'd never done it. And uh, I, I went skiing to um, Obersdorf, I think it was, so south, south Germany. Um, God, it was good fun, you know. And they say that people who've got a visual impairment will learn better 
than somebody who can see because you're um, you're reacting to everything in your in your legs rather than sort of anticipating what's coming. Oh. Um, I mean, that's my excuse. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what I was told when I started it. And you know, I learned to ski. I, I think it was a I think it was there for just for a week. And uh, the, the, there's a um, a cup that you can win for. They don't call it most improved. It's it's like again the person who's got the most out of the week. Um, and I think my instructor was, was very, maybe annoyed. Um, a lot of people go skiing for the apres ski, don't they, and go and have a croissant and go and have a coffee and then they're going to, no, I just wanted to ski. And um, instead of a lunch break, I think we'd, we'd, uh, we'd have five minute quick hot chocolate and back on the mountain. And uh, I've run him ragged. Because, <laughs> you know, you're only there for a week or so. You just want to make the most of it, don't you? You've got this ski pass. You know, it, it doesn't come around for free too often. So, f in my eyes, I wanted to learn to ski and I wanted to do it properly. Uh, and on the last day, there was a, a presentation from what used to be the Combined Services Disabled Ski Team, which you know, Armed Forces Para Snow Sport Team, um, about how you can apply to join their race team. Um, so, of course, me being me, I thought, oh, yeah, give that a go. Um, I went on a few training camps with them, a few indoor races over in this country, and ended up at Maribel. Um, south of France at the Inter Services Championships, um, and the the sort of I don't like using the word disabled side because even though they called them Combined Services Disabled Ski Team, you know we're not all we're not disabled. You know there's there are people with disabilities, but there's also people with with conditions like me that are not really classifiable to go to the Paralympics. Um, but there is some sort of a a condition that stops you doing it. You know as one of the, the elite army skiers would do it, for instance. Um, so that they have a, a system where um, there's, I think there's four races, and whoever comes out on top out of all that wins a, a gold medal and gets presented in front of the whole elite services championships alongside them getting their medals. Oh. Um, and I, I, I got it. So <laughs> it. It was one of those surreal things that, you know, I'd never skied before, and, and I think it, it was about 13 months from start to finish that I'd, I'd never skied before and then got a gold medal. I, I know it, it, saying I've got a gold medal, you'd, you'd think I've been to some sort of Paralympic Games or something where I've, I've raced against people with the same condition as me. But, you know, it's still nice to have a gold medal, but, <laughs> you know, we, we all had different, different injuries, different illnesses, um, so it wasn't really fair. You know, if, if, if I was to have fallen over on that last corner... Then I'd have came last, um, but I didn't. So, <laughs> <laughs> but re really, really good experience. And, and again, like the Invictus Games, they've they've got a, a huge following, and and a, they're just great people. They do great great things for for wounded and sick. Battleback, well, Battleback and the Armed Forces yeah, Paris yeah, Nail Sport yeah, Team. Yeah. yeah. So r remind me, remind, remind me about Battleback. See, I've heard of them, but I don't know the de the details. They're um, part of a recovery pathway that are funded by, I think they're funded by the British Legion military, um, Health for Heroes and, and, and others, I think. Um, and they've got a centre in Lillishall in Shropshire um, where people who are, um, I'm not sure how it works with veterans, if veterans can go or not. I don't think they can to that one. I think that's for serving personnel that are recovering or, or people that go to Headley Court that's now Stanford Hall, I think. Um, I've, I've never been to the centre. Um, but I, I, you know, I know about it through through my own work that we've we've had people go through there, and and they, you know, they'll do tryout weeks of um, archery, cycling, swimming, mountain biking, canoeing, that sort of thing. I, in fact, I think it is open for veterans. Think about it now. I think maybe it wasn't during during lockdown or something. There's something in my mind there that says it was, and it wasn't. But you know, it's worth looking into. It, it, it's a hell of a place. Mm. So how did you get into your welfare job that you do now? How did you end up doing that? Oh, <laughs> when I left left the army in um, 2018, um, and I went to work for for a telecommunications company as a trainee engineer, and I struggled massively with the the little bits of fibre and the little bits of cable. I I just couldn't see it properly to to do what I needed to do, and and I um, I mean I was at the lowest I'd ever been. I didn't want to leave the army. You know, it was it was the end of my my contract, uh, and because of my eyesight, knowing what I know, being a recruiter, if you've got keratoconus, you cannot serve in the military. Um, so 
my contract finished, I you know, I thought, well, I'll follow a pathway. What a lot of the, the guys and girls do and go go down this engineering route. Um <clears throat> and I was I was so low. I mean, it, it pains me now thinking about it. You know, I, I had everything anybody could want. I've got two lovely daughters. I've got a, a great wife. You know, we've got a house. We've got a nice car. And uh, and I, I was running through my mind was crash your van. Crash your van. You don't want to be here. Crash your van. Hit that lamppost. Hit this oncoming car. Crash it into that field. And and as it happens now, I, I look back and think, well, why, why was I thinking that? With the intent of what? Of killing yourself? No. I wanted to go home, and and I, I don't think I I wanted to admit myself to myself that I couldn't do the job. I wanted an excuse to go home, and and it was just a. It, it's such a strange thing to think now that that I was willing to do something that extreme just to to save face, and thankfully I didn't do it. You know, I I started crying. Part of the van, and and the first thing that we all do is phone my mother. Um, I feel sorry for my mother. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the amount of times me and my brother phoned her in tears, you know, it's just sort of default setting, isn't it? Um, I suppose she'd been married to my dad. He's in the Paris. So. <laughs> Her brother was in the Paris as well, so you know, she's obviously got a bit of. <laughs> what did you say to her? I just told the truth. Just came out with everything, and. Uh, you know, she she would just go home. Tell them, you know, go and see the doctor. The doctor will tell you what to tell the tell work. Um, and that's what I did. You know, well, I phoned my wife after once I calmed down a little bit. I phoned my wife. I didn't want to panic her because she, she, you know, she works with the NHS and at the time the children were very young. Um, and yeah, I told her. Got a doctor's appointment. Doctor signed me off. Um, I was diagnosed with. Um, Anxiety, depression, and adjustment disorder. Adjustment disorder. So what they're saying is that it was it was a, a case of when I was leaving the military, uh, I just couldn't physically adjust to to a new way of life. Well, I've never heard of that adjustment yeah. disorder. Yeah. So I was put on medication, um, went to um, therapy, CBT therapy with uh, the local NHS. Um, and in the meantime, I'd got another job. I mean, just, it, you know, I was, I was on sick leave for a good few months, um, and I, I thought, well, what what am I going to do? What what have I got that I that interests me? And I really enjoyed the recruiting element of of the army. You know, my last few years, and I thought, well, I'll go and be a commercial recruiter. My God, <laughs> <Brutal>. <laughs> go on. Um, uh, it was only a temporary job, and you know, very good of them to. To allow me to do, to do the job, and uh, you know, and I'm an open and honest guy. You know, with my background, I think I told them everything, um, and you know, they were very welcoming. Um, and and s- I was only there for a, about a month, month and a half, and uh, I was having a really bad day one day, um, and we're three floors up in a in, in a complex, and I, I found myself on the top top window ledge, just standing there looking down. With tears down my eyes, uh, down my cheek, and I still, to this day, don't know why. Um, and I, I've wrapped my brain trying to think. Well, what, what were you trying to do? What What do you want to achieve out of that? And and I, I don't know. Um, was I going to jump down? I don't know. You don't know why you're upset either. No, I, I have good days and bad days. You know, as as we you know we all do. I was on medication at the time for for mental health as well. So. Maybe it was just a low mood that that got the better of me, um, you know. And, and that job was coming to an end anyway, so maybe it was the the panic of having to look for another job. Um, so yeah, I, I thankfully somebody had come and talked me down, and, and I went to the the GP again. They increased the medication and sent me back to the the therapist. Um, and we we were looking through jobs, and this one for Defence Medical Welfare Service came up, and uh, I'd worked them before at Selly Oak Hospital when I was when I was part of the welfare team there, and I think they do a wonderful job, and and they always have done, um, supporting the armed forces community, and it was only a part time job. It was in Hereford, you know, and and there's not many jobs like that come up in in Herefordshire, 
and uh, I, I really, really wanted it. Um, so I applied for it, and you know, thinking nothing of it. I uh, had an interview. Um, I think it's a week later, or, or, or whatever it was. And I said, "Yeah, we'll let you know in in a few days." And I was just, you know, when you come out of an interview, and, and I just thought, "Well, that was rubbish." I just thought I'd fluffed everything. And um, <laughs> within two hours, they phoned me and offered me the job. Um, that was three years ago now. Oh, quite. Um, and I've since won uh, an award for operational excellence in in my field during um, COVID-19. I've um, I've been nominated for a Soldier and Honor Award, um, Veterans Award for Role Model of the Year. I mean, I didn't win, but it, it was just such an honour and a privilege to to be recognised that, you know, I've came so far from, from where I was before starting this job to to being so passionate about this job and, and helping the armed forces community in, in the place where where I was, potentially. Um, and and it, just, it just makes me... Makes me feel very good about it. You should do, mate. It's awesome. Uh, it's awesome. You know, it's, it's imp- he, like I mean, you know, this it's like it's, it's really important. I, th- I think that um, I think that people who are on the on the are coming through or have got over or come out of a men- of of not just mental health, a bad time in life, more in what for whatever reasons, physical, mental, combination, whatever, um, and come out the other side in in a in a better place than they expected and are able to articulate mm. what they've what their experiences were and lessons in a way that isn't preacher style i know everything you don't just drive it down the throat i think you know if, if they're willing then we have an ob- obligation to pass that knowledge on it i think yeah. whichever way we can and you found it sounds like you've ended up in the perfect place to do that you know yeah definitely um because especially in a you know our community we find it very difficult and generalizing obviously but we find it difficult to for someone who hasn't got a, a similar background to listen to advice from them, life advice, yes, you know, yeah. mental health advice, flipping get back on your feet advice, because we're just the way we are, like, you know, yeah. we're, we're a tight-knit community, who, you know. Um, an example being us having this conversation today, you know, you don't me, know me from Adam, but, you know, you're speaking openly and candidly as that stuff in this podcast, and I'd argue that you wouldn't be doing this if I was not of a similar background to yourself. You know, it'd yeah, be true. a slightly different conversation. So now, mate, it's awesome. It's good. Uh, wh- what specifically are you doing there? So I'm classed as a welfare officer. Um, so m- my job is to assist those veterans. It starts. There's various different projects that that run um, within the charity. So when I was taken on, it was to help veterans over the age of 65 to transition from hospital to go back home to live more independently. Um, you know, that that could be a you know, helping them with, with their shopping. Um, something as simple as just nipping in once a week to see how they are. Uh, but then you've got the other complex side of things when you could be liaising with so many different parties in, in their their discharge with complex discharge, um, social workers, um, different military charities to get a, a wet room, uh, a stair lift, a ramp, um, a car with, with driving aids on or something, you know, things like that. Um, and, and that sort of changed a lot with covid it, it i turned into a a mobile welfare wagon um, and i was going around i think i had 60 65 clients on my my list that i was going to see weekly to to deliver prescriptions deliver food um welfare checks just to make sure they're they're all right and still there because all elderly yes oh. but well most of them most of them um there's a few younger ones that are, they've got very complex ptsd um issues that you know um we we i personally can't can't help them with the, their um diagnosis or anything but i've i've got the links in to to various different players within the nhs that can um and and that can can help with their i mean for instance the guy that i'm i'm speaking to at the minute i'm i'm just his sounding board two hours a week he'll phone me and have a whinge you know that that helps him massively um and he's such a lovely guy um and, and you know i look forward to his chats um, but then I, I've also got a lot of detail that if he was to say something that wasn't quite right, I could phone somebody that could could put something in place for him, if that makes sense. Um, 
And it's just, to me, to give something back to the community that served me so well over the years, it's just brilliant. And I just love going to work. Which, you know, how many people can say that they love going to work? I bet it's not many. A fraction. <laughs> very, 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 very few. Yeah. Very rare these days, eh? Looking at it, but... Sounds like it's th th they're lucky they've got you too. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> 65 people flipping out. That's a big old roster. Goodness me. That must be very challenging. Yeah, it was. But it, it was, we were all doing our bit, weren't we? Through uh, through COVID. I mean, my, my wife work, works for the NHS. She's working in the emergency department. So thankfully for us, you know, the children were still going to school three days a week. Um, so she could still do her shifts in, in the emergency department while I was going to do my work. Um if I wasn't doing it, who else would? That, that's the way I was thinking, you know. A lot of these people haven't got families. They haven't got anybody. Um, and, and some of them even did have family, but they, they didn't want to see them because of passing the virus on. You know, I, I was quite happy to go and just chat through the window. Um, and thankfully, you know, the weather was quite nice for the, the first, first couple of lockdowns, wasn't it? So, you know, it... I don't even want to say it was a challenge because it wasn't. It was just enjoyable. I think I'm, I'm probably one of the most lucky people through the whole the whole of this COVID pandemic that I that I had a, a, an enjoyable time of helping others. Um, it has got its downsides, obviously. Yeah, unfortunately, we lost my granddad um, to COVID last year. He was a Palestine veteran in the he was in the Rimi. Um But you know, the most part for work anyway. You know, it was thoroughly enjoyable 18 months. Good. Mm. Good. <laughs> <laughs> we can start wrapping it up, mate. Um, been a pleasure talking to you. What have we not... Oh, hang on, you've got a book. You've got a book about... You've got a book out, uh, you? Yeah, I, I released a book uh, about two years ago. There's another one on the way. Um, oh, is it? Yes. Okay, well, I've yeah. not finished the first one yet. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, though, it is... Because I, 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 I picked it up... Um, well, I uh, picked up the copy... I didn't realise it's it, the way it was written that the this the in, on the pages is for people with um, yes. visual impairments. Yeah, it's very easy to read. Yeah, it's very different to reading a normal book. And that's <laughs> massive, this is why I, massive I, letters, <laughs> not many le lines on a page. <laughs> well, it, it'll take you about what forty minutes to read it cover to cover. You know, it, it it's got a hundred pages. The the writing's spaced um, at visual impairment level for. You know, we had a chat before this, uh, and I said I don't read many books because the writing's too small, and having a magnifying glass to read a book well, it just takes the enjoyment out of it. And, and I, you know, I've got a Kindle, but you know, swiping up and down and zooming in and out—it's just a pain in the backside, really. Um, so I thought I'll do it properly, as if I want to read it. And I didn't take it to a publisher. I didn't get it proofread. I did it myself, and I wanted it to come across as if I was telling you the story it, it was supposed to be my account of my condition um a, and if there's grammatical errors well yeah that's how i talk so that's how <laughs> it gets written um and and you know i'm quite proud of the fact that it's my book nobody's touched it um and, and i wanted to to sell 10 copies and inspire 10 people with keratoconus to live a, a more fruitful life um and i think i've sold over 500 copies oh, good uh, and I don't take any money from it. The the, the money that comes through, um, obviously Amazon take a percentage for postage. Um, er, all the royalties that come to me go to Fight for Sight, the eye research charity. You know, I didn't want anything for it. It's not it's not to make profit. It's to to help others. Um, so that that's the reason it, it's done like that. And uh, the next book will be um, the same. It, it's it's called Twenty Eight Cars Later. A bit of a car nut. Um, so it, it, again it's written by me about the cars I've owned over the years and uh, there's a few things in the pipeline that I'd like to do before the book's finished there's a, a chapter at the end um, that I'm, I'm saving for something special um, and, and all the profits for this book will go to Mission Motorsport with it being a motoring book um, so I, I got a, a Guinness World Record uh, at February last year okay. uh, so I, I ran <laughs> Ran a mile blindfold, and uh, I was the fastest man on the planet for a, about well, three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody else broke it by about 10 seconds, and, and subsequently somebody's broke it now by about five minutes. So I'm never getting that one back. <laughs> um, but I, I'd like the visually impaired land speed record in a car, uh, which currently stands at about 201 miles an hour. 
Um, how so far have you got? To, how, what's the length? What's the, how far you got to drive at that at the uh, speed? I, they did it at the longest airfield in Britain, um, Elvington, I think it's called. So it'd be done in the same place. I would, I would like to think. I take it you're talking to Jim about this, Jim Cameron. Yes, yeah, and various other manufacturers that we, we need a car fast enough over that short. It, it is a short distance because the runways in this country are nowhere near long enough to, you know, to do it in in certain vehicles. Um, which is why I've been t speaking to Jim. Um, I need to see him again, actually, because uh, I've noticed there is not a visually impaired land speed record for an electric vehicle. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that's one in the pipeline as well. Sounds good, mate. We never know. Sounds Jim's good. always up for a challenge, so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, good old Jim Cameron. Um, mate, it's been a pleasure. Well, um, how can people get hold of you? Twitter, you're on Twitter, aren't you? Yeah, Twitter at Ash underscore adventure um, yeah. Instagram is at ash.adventure and the book is called Keratoconus and Me and it's on Amazon yep yes. highly recommend yeah. I've got a copy of it and uh, that's it mate it's been a pleasure no thank you very much really thank nice you to coming. meet you you too cool done that's it thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear if not, if it's not already appeared. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the, uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Chower. Becoming a patron of Hey Chower, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about 5-10 minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of Hey Chower have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about 10 minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's always, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK Podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK Podcast. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.